Hi everyone, my name is Lily and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Great Smokies Writing Program and welcome to the March session of Writers at Home. Uh, this is 2021, happy spring, it's the second day of spring. Um, just a quick disclaimer before we get started, uh, there was a recent miscommunication that this was going to be a prose masterclass workshop. Um, this will just be a reading today, we will be hearing readings from students in the prose masterclass for the spring. Um, another quick disclaimer, there will be some adult language, uh, do with that information what you will. And sorry for any confusion, but thank you all so much for joining us. And as always, a huge shout out to Malaprops for virtually hosting. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that our summer workshops should be posted to our website soonish. Uh, we'll have a handful of five week workshops in June and July featuring character building, finding your poetic voice, YA literature, and creative nonfiction that you won't want to miss. I'll post an announcement to our Facebook page and we'll email the listserv when the descriptions are on our website. Um, and you can keep an eye on that. That is greatsmokies.unca.edu. If you've taken classes with Great Smokies before or have been to our spring or fall Great Smokies review um, readings, then you know that Elizabeth Lutchens needs no introduction. This is her 12th year of leading the prose masterclass, um, an intensive 15 week writing workshop for experienced writers focusing on long-term projects. She is an editor and a formal journalist, a graduate of the MFA program at Warren Wilson College, and the current editor-in-chief of the Great Smokies Review, and is currently working on her uh, historical fiction novel. We're so lucky to have her with the program, and we're so lucky to have her here today to introduce our readers. Elizabeth, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you, Lily. Um, sorry, somebody just asked me a question. Um, if I wanted to update my program right this minute, and I don't think I will, but I always like to say that I'm the lucky one to be able to lead uh, this class, this prose master class. It's an ongoing course offered by the Great Smokies, naturally, and as Lily said, 12 years ago, um, this is when we started this, Tommy Hayes and I were talking about some kind of a class that would benefit writers who'd been in the program for a while and wanted to have something that was more intense and, and a smaller group so that, so that we could all spend more time with each other's work as well as with our own writing. So uh, this is the next step in the Great Smokies for, for many people who want to continue fiction or nonfiction. So today you're going to hear from just six of the 10 people in the class this semester. They're outstanding writers, but they are also, to my mind, outstanding members of their writing community, both this class and the wider community. First, we will hear from, and I'm going to read about them all at once so that we don't have to interrupt the flow once we start the readings. First, we'll hear from the Reverend Dr. Margaret Ann Faith, better known as Sam, um, who's an Episcopal preach and leadership educator. Um, she's the academic dean of the Iona School for Ministry of the Diocese of Western North Carolina. Her essays, poems, and sermons have been published in the Great Smokies Review, Fiction Southeast, the Journal of Gratitude, Smoky Mountain Living, and in numerous ser sermon anthologies. She's currently working on a novel set in the coal region of West Virginia. Janet Smith Moore writes short stories because she says, in the words of David Sedaris, they take me out of myself and then stuff me back in, outsized now and uneasy with the fit. Her story, Thanksgiving, appeared in the 2020 Great Smokies Review and was a finalist in the North Carolina State University's 2020 short story competition. In 2018, her story, Beatitudes, placed third in Ireland's 2018, sorry, twice, uh, Fish Publishing Short Story Competition and was published in that year's Fish Anthology. In 2020, she co-authored In Pursuit of a Greater Good, a history of Western North Carolina communities and its work in rural economic development from the 1950s to the present. She's now at work on a collection of stories set in the Carolinas. P.S. Zhang was born in Chapel Hill and raised in Sanford, North Carolina. This is her first reading. Jeanette Reed moved to Western North Carolina after a career of teaching high school English and began writing poetry and short prose. She credits the mountain setting and the Great Smokies writing program as her pathways toward the joy of writing. 
The process of looking, listening, and writing, she says, has enabled her to see the outer world more keenly and to discover deeper meaning in her own life. Carson Minow is a journalist, writer, and filmmaker who splits time between Asheville, North Carolina, and Washington, D.C. Her short story, The Crack, will be published in the upcoming spring edition of the Great Smokies Review. Lisa Bloom is the J.M. Robinson Professor at Western Carolina University, studying imagination and creativity in children and youth. In her own creative life, she draws, writes, tells stories, and fantasizes about getting her novel published. Lisa is also a five-time silver medalist in race walking at the World and National Senior Games. We will begin the readings today with Sam Faith. Sam? Every couple I know has one partner who's designated as the detail manager, the filer of taxes, the dispenser of the dog's monthly flea and heartworm medications, the one who renews the car registrations, finds the mustard in the fridge, and plans the vacations. Two years ago, my beloved and I realized that we had not taken a vacation in five years. Who needs a vacation when you start each morning sipping coffee in an overstuffed chair while the sun peeks over the Blue Ridge and the sky leaks light in brilliant pastels? Who needs a vacation when you can walk out of your back gate and hike for miles in the solitude and unspoiled beauty of the Pisgah National Forest? Who needs a vacation when the canoe racks wait on top of the car and the serene and sinuous French Broad River flows by only five minutes away. We certainly didn't need a vacation, but craving a change of scenery, we decided to head north. I would drive from Asheville to Philadelphia, stopping in DC for a day or two to see cherished friends. Then Paul would fly to Philly. We'd spend a few days with our son and daughter-in-law and then proceed to Maine where the cooler weather and the ocean views always enchanted us. It sounded like a good plan. The day after our general planning discussion, Paul announced that our vacation was all organized. Airlines booked, rental car arranged, accommodations reserved. Even the canoe trip down the Delaware River Gap had been sorted out. I was impressed, curious, and slightly nervous. My Control issues are both a source of good natured teasing, self deprecation, and occasional annoyance in the life we share. I excel when somebody wants to find their birth certificate or wonders if we need more gin. My confidence and comfort falters when life throws uncertainty into the mix and I have to improvise. Traveling with a disability. Uh, poses unpleasant challenges and leaving things to chance fills me with a low level of anxiety. Aside from the fact that I'd rather spend two days alone in a car listening to a good audiobook than fly for two hours, it seemed it sounded like a feasible plan. I thanked him for taking care of things and privately warned myself to be appreciative, pleasant, and flexible with any uncertainties that might occur. It was a sweltering 100 degrees outside on the early October day we drove to the Charlotte airport, but our flight was easy and we were happy to see our son's lanky figure and beard shredded grin awaiting us in the arrival area at Philadelphia. We planned to spend Thursday relaxing while Sean and Kristen went to work. On Friday, we'd set out for the Poconos and take a detour to visit my grandparents' graves. Sean and Kristen would work a half day and meet us at the hotel in the Poconos. We all looked forward to the canoe trip on Saturday. My DNA is rooted in the disorienting contrast of natural beauty and man-made squalor that defines the Northern Appalachians. My people lived and died in the mines of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. The mountains and forest are defaced and scarred by the residual damage of the coal industry. Scenic rivers are fed by streams that carry toxins from industrial waste dumps. The zephyrs blow in particulates from the mountains of slag, covering everything from porch swings to laundry on the clothesline with a greasy, gritty coating of coal dust. 
Storefronts on old main streets are a hodgepodge of vaping emporiums, resale shops with bald one-armed mannequins and faded for rent signs. But the mountains, lakes and streams endure and there are pockets of beauty reserved for tourists who can afford ski weekends and summer holidays in cozy lodges with fine dining and modern amenities. I was eager to settle in for a few days of fun with the kids. As I fiddled with the GPS on my phone, I asked Paul the name of our resort. The Pocono Paradise, he answered. I smiled and looked over at him. No, really, what, what's the name? He looked puzzled. That is the name. My mind drifted back to copies of Cosmo magazine from the 1970s and the resort ads buried in the back next to ads for sex toys and cheap lingerie. Full page glossy ads of places with names like Pocono Paradise, adult only resorts where you could spend your honeymoon in a room with an elevated bathtub shaped like a giant champagne coupe. I reminded myself of my resolution to be cheerful and supportive of his plans. What, he asked. I have never perfected the art of the poker face. It got great reviews and it isn't cheap. I'll bet it isn't, I muttered sotto voce as we turned into the property. As we proceeded down along the drive, a long weed tangled strip of grass offered the first glimpse of the delights of the Pocono Paradise, a Frisbee golf course. Each target marker exhibit a different romantic icon, a heart, a cupid, a wedding ring, all displayed in peeling faded paint on balsa wood cutouts. They all seem to have leaned awkwardly into the passage of time, lending a forlorn air of dashed hopes to the landscape. Paul made a small choking sound. I kept my mouth shut and stared ahead. The main lodge was a three-story white stucco building with brownish green water stains etching a trail down the side. A large red heart sculpture hung from the portico over the main entrance. The first thing that we saw in the lobby was a 10 foot high champagne glass filled with styrofoam packing peanuts. I told Paul I was going to find the restroom while he checked in. I located the ladies room next to a gift shop specializing in bathrobes, mylar balloons and contraception. None of the bathroom stalls had functioning locks and the soap dispensers had all run dry. I returned to the lobby with a brief detour to check out the display of photography that adorned the walls. Photos of dogs dressed in doggy wedding attire. Pomeranians and poodles in bridal veils and teeny tuxedos. I reminded myself of my resolution. Paul was waiting for me at the main reception desk with a look of panic and desperation on his face. Sometimes after over 40 years, I can actually read his mind. I could hear the silent pleading, please don't yell at me, please don't yell at me. I smiled and the clerk explained our room options. We could have a queen size square bed, but the room is located over the bar. As there were several wedding parties there that weekend, the live band would be playing late. How late, I asked. They usually stop by two, he answered. He explained that he had a much quieter room in a cabin where Sean and Kristen could be lodged next door, as long as we didn't mind a round bed. I chose the cabin with the round bed. We returned to the car, passing a group of drunken groomsmen drinking beer out of a cooler in the bed of a pickup. As we passed, one of them leaned over and vomited on the parking lot. I didn't say a word. The cabin was set on the edge of a large algae glazed pond. A gazebo for wedding ceremonies was located across the water. Paul unlocked the door and I asked if he was going to carry me over the threshold. The first thing we noticed was the smell of damp and mildew. The carpet was a cheap blend of what seemed to be rayon and astroturf. Maybe the dead cockroach in front of the electric fireplace had set out for a nice stroll and died of disappointment. The bed was indeed round and the headboard was made of small panes of mirrored glass. 
Light bulbs reminiscent of a theatrical makeup mirror surrounded the large round mirror that was mounted on the ceiling over the bed. There was no nightstand or ledge for an older lady to put her vacation reading, eyeglasses, or nighttime beverage. Everything was decorated in a garish shade of pink, a blend of Band-Aid and Pepto-Bismol. The centerpiece of the suite was a jumbo heart-shaped pink hot tub. The tub was brightly lit and surrounded by mirrors around the sides and on the ceiling. My beloved has seen the changes in my body over 43 years. He has witnessed the slow transformation of pregnancies, weight fluctuations, surgeries, and my fondness for baking. I don't strut around naked like I used to before children, but neither have I grown coy. Still, the idea of taking a bath in the bedroom seemed slightly vulgar, and I was glad that I had already showered. Paul sat on the bed looking dejected. I kissed the top of his head and said, no complaints, I promise. Then I added, but I will reserve the right to tease you about this for the rest of your life. Just then there was a knock on the door and Sean and Kristen stepped in trying not to laugh. Sean saw the cockroach and said, your pet is dead. Paul began to apologize, but they cut him off. Let's find somewhere to eat, Sean suggested, but not here. We found a good steakhouse a few miles down the road in and enjoyed fine food and wine delivered haltingly, but in good order by Mildred, who informed us that she had been working there since 1957. After di dinner, we returned to our cabins and I settled awkwardly into the round bed while Paul and the kids went to see the comedy show at the Pocono Paradise stage. And the comedian grew angry at his failure to get laughs and began to hurl insults at the audience. My family fled. The next day was the consolation prize for the tacky accommodations. The heat had dissipated overnight and it was the first cool day of autumn. The sun sparkled on the water of the Delaware River Gap and the current offered some help as we paddled 10 miles down the river. The reeds drifted lazily in the current and a variety of aquatic life swam about in the clear water. Dragonflies hovered like iridescent river guides. There was no need to talk. We paddled and floated and soaked in the beauty around and beneath us. The bathtub in the bedroom and the astroturf on the floor seemed very far away. We returned to our rooms late that afternoon and after a day on the river, I needed a bath. While Paul and the kids went looking for the Pocono Paradise gym, I filled the tub and disrobed. I slipped into the tepid water and leaned backwards. There I was in my uncovered, unadorned state, staring back at myself from the ceiling. It was like the disturb disturbing scene in a modern thriller where Granny's naked corpse is depicted floating, bloated and serene in the koi pond. I sat up quickly and look, found myself that the configuration of mirrors surrounding the tub created the disorienting effect of being surrounded by flabby, naked old women. So many of them, cascading one behind another toward eternity. It was very close to my idea of hell. I bathed and dressed quickly and settled into the one chair in the room where I could see, see my, not see myself in a mirror. There are times in life when you find yourself out of place, somewhere you clearly don't belong. The Pocono Paradise was built to cater to young lovers who find mirrors and champagne jacuzzis the height of romance. People whose weaknesses for Dunkin' Donuts or Paps Blue Ribbon do not yet show on their bodies. But there are also times in life when you can float downriver in the easy companionship of those you love. The days when you see your child grown, successful, and happy, sharing easy laughter with his wife of 10 years. Days when the mountains remind you of strength, resilience, and the surprising beauty of crags and broken places. Days when the oppressive heat breaks and the freshness of change blows in with a promise. Paul came in from the gym where the broken treadmill and tipping exercise bike had reduced all three of them to uncontrollable laughter. He bent over and plucked the dead cockroach from the carpet. 
It has been a really nice day, I said, as he flushed the roach down the toilet. Some things you can control. Thank you, Sam. And I just add that that was a nonfiction piece. I'm not sure we said that before. Thank you very much. And next we'll hear from Janet Moore. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm gonna be reading a brief section from a new short story called Blood Born. On Saturday night, the husband confirms that the woman's temperature is indeed 103. The woman hadn't had a fever since that bout of influenza 30 years ago when their daughter was just a baby. If it continues into the morning, get yourself to the emergency room, the on-call nurse says, immediately. The woman sleeps sitting up just in case she has COVID-19 and her breathing becomes labored, but it doesn't. A deep, clear morning breath free of congestion brings momentarily, momentary relief to her but something is not right. She can feel it in her joints. The slightest movement makes them shriek and the temple thumping headache, that's not like her. She doesn't get headaches. We need to go to the hospital, she tells the husband. He dresses quickly and starts the car. She descends the stairs to the floor, one step at a time, grabbing the banister to keep from falling. When she gets to the bottom, she says, I'm too weak, better call an ambulance. Not life-threatening, he tells the 911 operator, but hurry just the same. The EMT takes her vital signs and slips oxygen tubing over her ears before gently resting its short prongs in her nose. This will make you feel better, he says. Her illness, whatever it is, has moved quickly, she tells him. Could COVID-19 happen this fast? She felt fine when she had the spinal epidural. I've had them before without any problem. Walk in, get a steroid injection, no more back pain for at least a while. Walk out a couple of hours later, piece of cake. That was 36 hours ago. It's probably unrelated, but I thought you, you should know. The husband's steady arm is there for her as she steps out of the ambulance. How lovely that it's not cold, she thinks. It usually is by late October. This is blackberry frost season after all. Did I put enough mulch on the dahlias? It's then that she sees her reflection in the hospital's glass door. An old woman clinging to her husband, white hair askew like a scared bird, sagging breasts, slumped shoulders. She's still wearing her pajamas, housecoat and slippers. The hospital greeter points a thermometer gun at her forehead, then at her husband's before handling them, handing them masks. How could we have forgotten them? The woman wants to explain. We're not irresponsible people, we wear masks. We acknowledge that the pandemic is real. We believe in science, we trust Anthony Fauci, and we have faith that the vaccines will save us. But this takes more energy than she has. The husband does the talking that she would normally do. Of the two of them, she's the chatty one. What was that expression her father had? Vaccinated with a big troll and needle. It always made her laugh except no one laughs anymore because they don't know what a Victrola is. Then the woman is in a room somewhere in the depths of the emergency room. A nurse covers her with a warm blanket and it makes her drowsy. Someone draws blood, but in her half sleep, she doesn't know who or when. What she remembers is the doctor. He introduces himself without making eye contact while he calls up her patient record. In the room's soft light, the computer screen glows a vital white. She recognizes his name and New England accent. They've worked together. She hopes he's better at administering care than he was running his department. He was always over budget. He used to wear a suit and worked in an office. What's he doing in a white coat working in the emergency department? This is a place for the young and energetic who crave adrenaline. He's too old, mid fifties now. You don't recognize me, do you? She lowers her mask. It takes him a minute. She's grayer now and pounds lighter. Well, what do you know? How long has it been, eight years? 10 actually, but who's counting? I won't ask how you are, he says. You wouldn't be here if you were doing well. It could be a good thing that he's taking care of her, 
They'd had disagreements, but nothing major. And he always got his way in the end. Here's what we know so far, he says. You have septicemia, a blood infection. It could be caused by Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. We don't know yet. The woman was an MBA degreed hospital administrator who managed people and problems. Clinical colleagues taught her enough about medicine to know that, staph infect, that a staph infection is deadly. If she's got MRSA, the antibiotic resistant strain, there's not much hope for her. She remembers a short story from the seventh grade. It had bold, dark illustrations. A boy is in danger. He's fleeing to Mexico. A man with a gun is after him. Why? Who wrote it? Steinbeck, she thinks. It wasn't Hemingway. She didn't read him until The Old Man in the Sea, and that was in the eighth grade. The boy in the story has a nasty cut on his arm that hasn't healed. Just when it looks like he's out of danger, he sees a dark line in a blood vessel near the cut. Gangrene, the teacher had told them. A deadly blood infection. The idea that your blood could kill you had stayed with her. She wants the husband here now, telling her that there are no dark lines in her veins and that she will not die. He's a scientist who knows math, Spanish, and the names of three-letter rivers in Russia. She knows opera, literature, and French. They're a good crossword puzzle team, and she wishes she was home working this week's puzzle with him. Dear God, spare me from MRSA, she prays. You know the drill as well as anyone, the doctor says. We need to order more tests, but it's taking longer than usual. The lab is understaffed, plus there's a, re there's a reagent shortage, COVID-19. What can we do? He shrugs before clicking his, uh, before turning his attention to the computer. Click, clickety, click, click, click. I'm admitting you until we know more. Any questions? She says no, but that's a lie. What she really wants to ask is, how in the hell did I get a fucking blood infection? Instead, she tells him how nice it is to see him even under these circumstances. That's a lie too. You're lucky to get a room so quickly, one just opened up, says the nurse pushing her bed through the sprawling new emergency department. The woman feels a twinge of guilt over her good fortune and wonder, wonders whether it's because of who she once was or whether she's really that sick. I'm glad you know where you're going because I'm totally lost, the woman says. It's so much bigger than the old one. When this opened, we thought, great, we finally have enough space. But how do you plan for a pandemic? They round a corner onto a wide hallway, one of the medical rabbit warrens major thoroughfares, and the woman gets her bearings. I know where we are now. On the walls are large framed colored photographs of happy people doing fun things together. She worked here when the employee photo contest was held and the winning images displayed. The contest was a big hit with the staff, a real morale booster. The hospital was not for profit then. Now it's for, owned by a sprawling for-profit system, just another dot on their moneyed map. The suits in charge aren't from around here. These pictures mean nothing to them. At least they haven't taken them down yet. So Janet, you're going to leave us hanging at that point? I am. I should have said this is an excerpt from a story by Janet. So uh, you will at some point, I hope, have a chance to read the whole thing. Uh, thank you so much, Janet. And next, we will hear from P.S. Zhang reading an excerpt from a story as well. Hi, I'm reading the, I'm reading the first pages of my short story, Anastagnosia. You're old when you remember, it was only trees there, not overgrown brush, not pasture, only trees. There was a place like that the fall my mother was first hospitalized. It was down a road called Whispering Pines. Dad and I followed the milk carton shaped ambulance as it zoomed down the quiet road and through the forest. Red and white lights sparkled against the southern magnolias, turning everything metallic. I had never been to the hospital. I had never been down with spring pines. It was so empty. The sirens blasted through our windshield and pummeled my ears. I felt the vibrations, but why hadn't I heard anything? All I noticed were the trees. Before the man in black pants and blue shirts came for my mother, Baba had gotten down on one knee and lifted me up by my armpits. 
I knew it was serious when I was sitting on my bed, but he was still bending his knee. My father was always baba then. I have to talk to mama about something very important, he said, adjusting the collar on my sweater. It might get loud. I want to keep you safe. I said nothing. My Barbie doll's pants were bunched up on one leg. I smoothed it down. Mama is having a bad time. She's not feeling well. She might get very unhappy and say things she doesn't mean. I said nothing. Barbie's pants were straight now, but her pink pump had fallen off. I hadn't been careful, too jerky. The shoe fell on the floor and bounced under my bed. Lost. Don't worry, Baba will take care of Mama, help her. Just lock the door and don't open it unless I tell you to, okay? Everything will be fine, I promise. I was eight years old, yet already aware of the gloom that draped our house. Strange things had been happening, and like a wave before it crumpled over its crest, something was going to take us down. A lot of people, if they had heard that conversation between Baba and me, would attack my father. Why would you, let your, why would you ask your daughter to do that? Why would you talk to your wife about such a sensitive topic while your child was home? Why didn't you handle this perfectly so that I, a stranger or acquaintance, can feel better about your family? It's easy to judge someone else's problem, someone else's family. What happens behind closed doors and insulated walls matters only to those inside until, of course, the insides spill out. And even for me, as a child without insight into how any of this worked, I was angry with my father. But you grow up and learn. You wouldn't have done much different. You're not so special or unique. When someone you love is sick and the matter is their brain, no one really knows what to do or how to handle it. Predictably, people mess up. They ignore or pretend symptoms away. Decisions are not forgiven and family relations change. Friends become scarce. They say, hope everyone is well and really mean it because they can't even look you in the eye when the words leave their lips. By then it doesn't matter. You've accepted the illness, the confrontations, the lifelong ups and downs. Eventually, you become a person who stays at home a lot. Whenever I thought of my family's transformation, I saw us as naive tourists before a tsunami, sunbathing and oblivious, our only concern was adequate SPF. Then suddenly the water receded and hundreds of fish and crustaceans flopped and scattered on the shoreline. We came closer to the water, not believing our eyes. Ocean birds gathered above, nose diving one by one and began the plunder of life. If we had wings, we wouldn't need higher ground. Dad tried his best. He wanted to protect mom. If it stayed small, no one would need to know she got better because no one would know she was ever unwell. In his mind, mom would be understanding, rational, empathetic. She was still May from the bakery, the girl who bicycled home ha hands-free, the girl who'd saved newspaper clippings about South America for him. One day they would board that boat from Ushaya to the Antarctic Peninsula. They would buckle themselves into bed as the ship plowed through the Drake Passage that May would accept medical care willingly. I remember my father putting the cordless phone into my palm. You might need to help Baba, can you do that? I nodded at him and felt the suctioning of the tide, the sand slipping between my toes and the whirling sound of an approaching wave. Baba showed me how to call 911. Mom had a love marriage with my father, another baker at the Cantonese industrial kitchen in Atlanta. They had both immigrated from the Guangdong province of China as teenagers, and they swapped homesick stories while rolling pork buns and scallion twists. Six months later, they were married. A year after that, I came into their lives. Our family was well formed when my mom was finally diagnosed with schizophrenia. I was almost nine, she was 34. There was a toy unicorn in my old room. He liked the moon, so I put him atop my window latch. But sometimes, if a car drove by, our apartment would shake and he'd fall off. I'd have to write him back. When I heard the panic of shuffling feet, the sound of metal falling, and my father screaming out like a wounded animal, I thought it was the unicorn speaking to me. Help me, Joy, please help me. Joy, Baba is trying to take you away from me. But toys only come alive when people are gone. The voices were in another room. Put the knife down, May. It's me, your husband. I'm trying to help you. We need to figure out what's wrong with you. Please, don't you remember me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong is I don't have a husband. Whose husband would try to commit their perfectly sane wife to the loony bin? The knife clanged against the wall as feet dashed through the kitchen. Baba called out, we need 
to make sure everything is okay. I love you. You've been acting out of sorts lately, not yourself, talking to someone, seeing things, thinking stairs are out to get you. Let's just clear it up with the doctor. I know everything will be fine. I know it, please believe me. Their voices came closer. We didn't have a big home. Someone was coming for me. Love me, you want to hurt me. You're the crazy one. You don't even believe me when I think about, when I talk about the baby, you don't even see the baby. My father shouted down the hallway, lock the door, Joy, lock the door like Baba said. You're the one who needs help. How can you not see what I see? What is so real? I have to protect myself from you, from everyone. Everyone is trying to get me, get me down those stairs. It was my mother who came for me. She pounded on my door. I covered my ears and crunched into a ball like a discarded sheet of paper. Please no, forget me, I'm gone. Joy, honey, open up. We need to leave. We need to get away from this man. He's going to have me committed. I can't be locked up. And then she started sobbing, unraveling like a rag doll. The seams had worn down and came undone. Honey, the stairs, the stairs and the baby, the baby and the stairs. They'll tear me apart and kill me. He's going to throw me down the stairs. I can't be alive. What about my baby? Please, Joy, come on, don't you love Mama? Baba said not to open the door. He said, you weren't feeling well. The words choked in my mouth, a storm drain of tears and mucus. Joy, let me in. She jerked at the knob. The screws shook from the force of her arm. Baby, let mama in. We have to get out. She banged on the door, fist and arm hitting the hollow plywood, then solid pine signing. Come on, let me in. I have to get you and the baby out. Her knees and feet slammed against the door. A dent began to form. Fingernails scratched at the frame. Soon a hole would give way. She would be in, and what came for her would come for me. Thank you. Thank you, P.S. Um, next, we'll hear from Jeanette Reed who will read a story, Jeanette. Jeanette, you're muted. I grew up in a rural county in West Tennessee and this story is rooted uh, in that area. The love seat. They saw it on Friday on the road home from Brownsville, an old fashioned love seat right out there straddling the center line. It was turned over with its hind legs sticking up in the air like a donkey, Cletus said, but Earlene recognized it before they even came to a stop. My Lord in heaven, she gasped, it's Ms. Baptist's love seat. It's what? The love seat from her front parlor. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, Cletus. I'm ought to know. I've dusted it every week for five years. Cletus shook his head. Well, then maybe you know what in tarnation it's doing out here in the middle of Route 7, where any fool could run into it and get himself killed. He got out of the truck, slamming the door so hard, paint, blue paint chips flew off the rusted edges and started pulling the love seat off the road. Earlene slid out her side almost landing in a drain ditch, and hurried around the truck. Wait, Cletus, wait, you'll scratch it to pieces. Hold on a minute, it's old. I can tell that, he stopped dragging, but still held on to the legs. Probably headed for the dump down there. People will dump anything anywhere on this road. I bet it fell off a truck and they couldn't be bothered loaded it back on. No, no, that's not it. This here's what Miss Baptist calls an heirloom. Something's been in her family a long time. She wants to get new covers on the cushion part. I seen the little bits of cloth she was choosing from. Well, I ain't toting this thing all the way back to Brownsville. Not for Miss Heirloom Baptist or nobody, but I am getting it off the road. Cletus, sugar, it's gonna rain soon. Just look at the sky. And that ditch is so close to the road, the wind could blow it right in. Just load it up, honey. We can put it on the porch until somebody comes for it. She ducked her chin and gave him her puppy dog look, the one that had got to him when they first met. Please. Shit, he said, picking up the two legs on his side while she hefted the other. She was a strong woman with some breadth to her, pleasantly plump, she liked to say, almost eclipsing his wiry frame. Next thing you'll be wanting me to pick up cow pies and haul them home. 
They rattled on down the road, Cletus scowling at the highway ahead. Earlene pleased as punch, but not daring to say so. She sneaked looks at the love seat through the rear window and felt her heart swell a little, proud to have such a fine piece in the bed of the pickup. When they got to the dirt lane leading up to their tenant house that sat right smack in the middle of Mr. Tipton's cotton field, she got anxious. The ruts in this road could bounce your head to the ceiling if you drove too fast. And she could tell by the look on Cletus's face and the way he shifted the gears, he was gonna do just that. Stop a minute, honey, hold on. She opened the door and heaved herself out before he could argue. Cletus, she called from the rear of the truck. Come back here a minute, sweetheart. I need you to help me. What in God's name are you up to now? But she already had the tailgate down. Just give me a hand here, sugar. I want to steady this settee over the bumps. Shaking his head, he clasped his hands together and bowed down to give her a foothold. Once on board, she tipped the love seats aright and spreading her skirts, seated herself in the middle of the faded gold cushion. The cotton field spread out before her like a kingdom <laughs> of tiny clouds. Cletus grunted back to the cab, but he drove slow a coach's pace, she imagined, down the length of the dusty lane. The love seat looked grand on the front porch. In fact, it perked up the whole house. It was the first thing you saw when you drove towards their place, just sitting there in a way that said quality, at least to Earlene. The kids' mouths gaped open when they saw it. Mama, said Jolene, who was 10, it's beautiful. She reached out her hand and hesitantly ran her fingers along the curved glossy wood on top of the back frame. Earlene scooped up baby Joe as he toddled over to look, holding a gummy peppermint stick in his fist. Ain't that pretty baby? No touching you here. All you kids, this here's for looking only. You hear me little Chris, little Cletus? I hear, who wants to sit on it anyways? Looks hard as a rock. You see baby heading for it, just slap his hand. Maybe on Sunday before we head out for church, I'll let you all sit on it for a little bit. Earlene, said Cletus, finishing up his mug of coffee in the doorway. You call Miss Baptist yet? Don't you fret, Cletus. She's gone on vacation. Won't be back for a couple of weeks. I'm just keeping it safe for her. Two days later, they were out in the field picking cotton when a black cloud moved across the sky from the west. It came slow like, but getting bigger and darker as it went along. When Earlene got to the end of her row, she cast a worried look up at the sky. Cletus, she called out. She could see him three rows away, but he didn't hear her. We got to stop, Cletus, a big one's coming. Cletus looked up at the cloud as the wind picked up. Not yet, he said. We could get in a couple of more rows. Get back to it now. No, no, we can't, Cletus. That rain will blow every which way. You know how it does when it looks like this. You were feared of getting wet all of a sudden? He asked without raising his head. Lord, no, not me. I'll dry out, but the love seat, we gotta move it. It'll be ruined if it gets soaked. Ned Cletus raised his head and gave her an unbelieving look. What? What's that you're saying? I'm out here trying to get a crop in and you're worried about some old junk furniture. Where's your senses, woman? It won't fit through the door anyways. Just keep picking. We'll throw something over it. Cletus, we ain't got nothing to throw over it. Nothing that'll keep it dry. Please, baby, you got to help me. We can turn it catty corner and get it through, but I can't do it by myself without banging it up. For God's sake, said Cletus, grabbing up his bag. I wish I'd smashed right through the thing when it was out on the road. Heirloom, my ass. It was a struggle, but they made it, twisting and turning it every which way, Cletus cussing and early and calling out, watch out and be careful, until the only thing left was for Cletus to take the front door off the hinges. The last bit of the love seat went through just as the rain blew up. Where do you want the dang thing, he asked. They all stood there looking at it. Early in thinking how small it had looked in Miss Baptist parlor. Here it was the biggest thing in the room, bigger than the old sofa Earlene's sister 
had passed on to them. Well, said Arlene, hmm, we could move that sofa beneath the window. Then whoever comes in the door will see the love seat right away. You do that, we won't be able to see the TV from the sofa without stretching our necks plumb around. She stood there in the doorway, her arms folded and rested on her ample stomach and considered. I know, we'll throw a bed sheet over the love seat when we want to watch a program and you and me will sit on it together. Just us, Cletus, not you children. Christ's sake, Earlene, it's only for a few days. All right, he sighed, let's get done with it. You all push. Then he walked out in the rain, heading for the truck. He came in much later, weaving his way to the house from the truck after her sister had come by to take the children off to a church supper. He came, Ooh, where's everybody gone to, he asked, setting himself against the kitchen table. Bernice took him sugar for the whole night. I'm fixing us up a good dinner here, roast pork and apples, your favorite, and Bernice brought us a banana cream pie. Earlene couldn't stop herself talking though she hadn't really looked him in the face yet. I thought we'd have us a nice quiet dinner, just take our time and then go in the front room and settle ourselves down on our little love seat to watch Lawrence Welk. Our love seat, what did Bernice have to say about that thing? I told her we found it. My goodness, Dumplin', ain't that what we did? You make it sound like we's keeping it. It don't belong, oh, Cletus, it belongs where it belongs. No one ever sits on it in that front pile at Miss Baggins. No one ever hardly goes in there. I don't think she even likes it. Seems like it sort of weighs her down. She'll likely be glad to have it off her hands. Cletus looked doubtful, but he sat down and dug in. They didn't say much during the meal. That was usually all up to Earlene anyway. Cletus liked to concentrate on his food. He finished off two platefuls. How he could eat so much and stay so lean was a mystery to Earlene. When he put down his fork, he looked up at her. It ain't ours, Earlene, it ain't right. Earlene ducked her chin and gave him a puppy look. Now, sugar, come on, we're just trying it out. Here, now don't be forgetting this. And she handed him a big slice of the pie. He finished it off and pushed back his chair. I got to say, when it comes to pies, Bernice is hard to beat. He looked at Earlene. But Aunt Minnie can cook up hog meat like you can with them apples and gravy and all. You ain't bad with chicken neither. She blushed. You can throw a compliment when you take a mind to. Come on, let's just leave this mess here and go sit on that sweet little love seat and watch Lawrence Welk. Earlene settled herself slowly down on the seat. About a third of it was left for Cletus, just enough to snuggle them in cozy. Don't you just love those bubbles, she said, as Lawrence Welk began. They make me feel all giggly and like. They do? He looked down at her sideways, then smiled and turned his eyes back to the picture. I go for the champagne lady myself. She weren't so skinny, I might have to take me a trip to Hollywood. Hush now, you're just trying to rile me. Earlene poked him in the ribs with her elbow and took his hand. What you taking hold of my hand for, woman? I might need it for something pretty soon. Like what, silly? Well, like this. And he reached his free hand down between her full breast and started nuzzling her neck. Cletus did like to nuzzle and Earlene's plump body offered lots of nuz nuzzling places. Cletus, don't you want to see the show? I'm seeing it, Bean Blossom, right here in this sweet little valley. He wiggled his fingers down further. Earlene jerked back and started to giggle. Stop that, Cletus, you're tickling me silly. Just stop now. She whooped and fell backward against the corner of the love seat in a fit of laughter, pulling Cletus with her. That's when they heard the crack. Before they knew what was happening, Earlene was on the floor with Cletus and half the love seat on top of him. Oh, Lord, sweet Jesus, wailed Earlene. Oh, help me, Cletus. I think I then broke my back. Cletus lay over her wary and stunned, then slowly started extricating himself. God damn son of a bitch, what kind of a fucking seat of love is that supposed to be? Earlene moaned from the floor. It took some maneuvering for him to get her up, lying there as she was, like a full bag of cotton, and whimpering every time he tried to hoist her. Finally, he got his hands under her arms 
and dragged her across the bare floor towards the old sofa. I'm going to lie down here beside you, Erlene. Then maybe with you pulling up and me pushing behind, we can get you onto the cushions. All right, sugar, said Erlene. She was actually feeling better now that she had caught her breath and starting to enjoy Cletus's attention. You feeling better, baby girl? Cletus asked, sliding his free arm across the middle. I sure do, precious. Let's just stay here for a while. The floor feels good. It's not too hard. No, it ain't, he rubbed his hand across her tummy. But something else is, and he slid himself carefully over the soft cushion of her body. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you very much. And next we'll hear from Carson, who is going to read um, some excerpts from her novel in progress. Carson? Hi. Um, these are excerpts from the novel I'm workshopping in this class called To the Light. It was night now again, and all she could see were miles of dimly lit corrugated roofing and this pod of soldiers whose laughs were shifting to sneers. She had ignored them too long. You, the boss one shouted, what you do? She played with her shoes, the white Nikes Polly had given her. They had been ruined all the way back in the Babylon throw up, but now the threads were unraveling, splitting the fake leather that was dyed through with grime. Polly had always kept his shoes so clean. Come here. The boss soldier was standing up now. Fatigue had enervated every fascia, incapacitating her limbs and making it impossible to stand. The soldier picked up his gun and threw the strap over his shoulder like a purse. He eyed her as he took the last slug of beer. She saw him motioning. All she could think to do was focus instead on a loose cobblestone in the middle of the alley. She studied its roundness in the darkness until some tufts of fur stuck to the top revealed it to be a goat head. By then the soldier was by her on the stoop. She heard the others whispering and finally looked up, but only into the eyes of the wary waitress who looked back at her as she gathered bottles. What you do, he asked again with yeasty breath. Morgan saw she shocked him with her round black pupils. First he flinched, then doubled over with laughter. She couldn't tell if she had been smiling or grimacing because her face wasn't sending signals to her brain anymore. When he calmed, he opened his hand and offered her a bouquet of wilted green leaves. She had barely enough energy to move her head, but her eyes followed his hands as he ripped a bunch off with his bony fingers. He shoved a leaf into his mouth where there was already a cud-like mass just under his bottom lip, like big league chew. The soldier held out a palm full of leaves. She felt her hand lifting from her shoe to take the offering. He mimed the action for her and she obeyed, placing the leaf in her mouth as the soldiers watched in silence from their table across the street. The boss soldier grabbed her jaw and rotated it for her. The sour juice of the leaves stuck to her teeth. The soldiers at the table whooped and wailed. They had red berets. Had the porch not been painted indigo, maybe it all would have gone differently. If there was one color that could lock in the destiny of so many people, it made sense to her later that it was this one, the color of karma's blueberry smoothies and the lilac fields of so many imagined heavens. Morgan's eyes popped open to the bare feet in front of her. The feet were very recently washed and the damp skin was lightly powdered by a fresh layer of dust. The skirt brushing the slender ankles had a rim of blue silk embroidery, perfect squares within squares within squares, needlework a person could get lost in. She heard bracelets jangling above, then closer to her face as warm hands shook her shoulders. Get up, you, get up now. Carl looked like the remainder of his dreams were curdling up within him. His lips bunched as Courtney spilled it all out for him in the too small car. First, the Joe part came streaming out sloppily. Then when Constance had wedged herself wing-wing in the back seat, Courtney dumped out the rest. Whatever it may have been, whatever may have been left of their familial oneness there in the carport with the engine running was trifurcating now in the afterglow of the news. They sat in silence for a long time. 
a little putt putt from the tailpipe once in a while reminded them where they were as one by one they gave in to the quiet part of crisis, accepting first circumstance, then their powerlessness before it. Constance placed a red shaking hand on Carl, and he, probably moved by her brave gesture of acknowledgement, grabbed his daughter's mother around her shoulders. If little Morgan had been unraveling them all, Courtney felt certain that in this moment, her sister was balling them all back together again from absentia. Carl's body heaved just once, and then he sat up straight and reversed out of the parking spot. She got all the money to go wherever she went from Polly, but he isn't the reason for this, Courtney said. Something burned in the eyes of her parents as they drove through the icy night toward the answer. They couldn't hear her, but passing the donut shop again, Courtney knew that Polly was not the why. The why, as a fact, was insignificant, but it hovered in Courtney's mind like a dream car or a trauma to explore later with a luxury out-of-network therapist. But here, racing and Carl's drop top to the safety of Courtney's apartment where they could uncloak the where, the why rolled off them like the icy rain Courtney saw dripping through the worn convertible top onto Constance's hand. Unwashed, unpacked, mortality descended on each of them while this fact of why slipped out the window to where it belonged, neither here nor there. Constance ravaged the guest room, pushing the mattress off the box spring and finding nothing but a tennis sock. Courtney dug through the drawers, pulled out her honeymoon tickets and tax return and Joe's passport. She pulled the whole drawer out and turned it on end, sending pens and coasters rolling just to be sure that what was missing was truly gone. Carl paced in the kitchen and dialed the phone again, got Karma's machine. Where would she have gone? What does she even know about the world? From up the stairs outside the kitchen, Do Love Malone entered stage right, commissioned to come retrieve the last of Joe's things. What you say, what done guan? Thank you, Carson, very much. Uh, and our last reader is Lisa Bloom, who is also going to be reading a story. Lisa? Thank you, Elizabeth. This is Quarantine Quagmire. Lydia thought that quicksand was a likely way to die. At least once a week, she watched a cowboy disappear slowly into thick gray goop that paralyzed his legs, feet, and arms. Mud oozed into his mouth, nostrils, and ears till nothing remained but a hat. Like when they took her dad away, the ambulance sucked him in. His loafer fell from his foot. All that was left of him lay in the middle of the tarred road. On her black and white TV, quicksand looked like the muddy patch in her yard, the part near the old chicken coop where grass struggled to grow. Lydia imagined walking along, unaware and having two feet stuck in mire before she knew it. When Timmy was trapped in quicksand, Lassie brought him a branch to grab hold of and pulled him free in the nick of time. On an old Western, a strong cowboy pulled a prairie girl who was up to her chin in quicksand to safety at the last minute. Lydia believed every second of it. How would Lydia survive if the ground in her path suddenly turned into a bottomless pit of muck? People who died in quicksand, usually the bad guys, were caught with their arms down, their hands useless. Lydia took her diary from beneath her mattress and sketched a stick figure trapped in mud with one arm in the air. If she stepped in quicksand, say when she took a shortcut to school through the cemetery, or maybe after a rain when the alley alongside the house gave way to mud, she'd use one hand to plug her nose and cover her mouth. She'd extend the other up as high as she could so her rescuer had something to grab hold of. She'd scream until the very last second and then fill her lungs before clamping her mouth shut. As Lydia grew and gained some sense, she feared a slow death of a different kind. She watched her older sister stuck in unhappy mar marriages. First, there was her sister Trudy who fell for Donald Antonini, a loud mafia type businessman 
with fierce blue eyes and angry black hair restrained by a thick layer of grease. One summer, on a visit to see Trudy and Donald in Cleveland, Donald took the family to the aquarium. Liddy had no shoes to wear because the strap on her sandals had broken. Donald noticed her bare feet when he handed her his, her ticket. You damn hillbilly, he scoffed. Don't walk near me, okay? Lydia, Lydia didn't know she was a hillbilly. She thought hillbillies came from rundown shacks in West Virginia and carried jugs of whiskey. Trudy stayed in the marriage for the fortune Donald made in his cleaning supply business. How could the wealth possibly be worth trudge, trudging through such nastiness? Maggie, Lydia's favorite sister, married Jared. Lydia watched him use a belt on her little niece and nephew. He had crazy ideas about the Mattel toy company and a fortune they supposedly owed him for telepathically stealing his model of a toy barn that opened and closed and stored tiny wooden farm animals. Jared announced that he was moving the family to an apartment next to the Mattel headquarters so that he could do 24 hour surveillance. Maggie and the children made a narrow escape. So afraid of getting trapped like her older sisters, Lydia watched her step at every turn. What were the odds that she could find someone like her father, the kind of man that would hold his young daughter in his lap on a snowy Sunday afternoon and share his popcorn while they watched Westerns and Tarzan movies on the TV? Lydia had blossomed, like her sisters, into quite a looker, so she had offers. Dave was the first. He professed his love on the third date. Not long after, Dave bought her an, a pre-engagement ring. He had to explain it to her. It means we'll be engaged someday, maybe in a year. In the meantime, they weren't to date anyone else. Lydia felt unsettled about pre-engagement. Even so, she liked Dave well enough until she learned that pre-engagement meant he was the boss. I can't believe you watched, you wasted my money on that movie, he snapped one night coming home from watching Willard. Your eyes were everywhere but the screen. The anger in his voice took her by surprise. I didn't like it, she said, pulling her hand from him as he tightened his grip. Is that a crime? When I pay for a movie, I expect you to watch it. They checked into a hotel that Saturday night to get away from Lydia's college roommates. Still stinging from the movie incident, Lydia wanted to get a complimentary drink at the hotel bar, and he didn't. He ripped her shirt when she tried to free herself from his grasp and get out the door. The last straw. She left without the drink and without Dave. Besides Dave, there were Matt, Rick, Jack, and two Pats. Lydia liked them all at first. Eventually, she would feel that familiar sense of suffocation and the need for a strong branch to pull herself from the mire. After each, she strengthened her resolve to, say, to stay single and protect herself from the hazards of love and marriage. In the spring of 1972, when Lydia had lost the desire to date, a friend talked her into traveling to a festival on the Shenandoah River. The first day she met Byron, a tall guy from West Virginia. Both eager for some relief from loud drunks and continuous passing of bongs, they took a walk through a meadow near the river. The spring pollen, thick and sweet, lingered in the air. He took off his faded fedora and held it close to his chest, the chest of his overalls. He looked up toward the sun and it glistened on his long blonde hair. He sneezed. Allergies, he said. She sneezed too and they both laughed. This would be a great spot for a wedding, Byron said. Lydia gasped for breath. Without looking at her, he added, but marriage isn't for me. And Lydia felt the fresh air fill her lungs and release with ease. That night, he played a harmonica on stage with the Nightcrawler's Bluegrass Band. Whether it was the pot, the cheap wine, or the spring magic, she wasn't sure, but in her Birkenstocks and bare toes, with her feet planted firmly on the ground, 
She felt euphoric as she swayed to the music. He smiled each time she caught his eyes. After two songs, he left the stage. They slow danced to a John Prine song, Paradise, that sub subsequently became her favorite tune. In the morning, they took a dip in the river. Lydia wore cutoffs in a tank. He swam in his briefs. She tested the water first. She covered her nose and mouth with one hand and held her other high in the air as she slipped from the rock into the freezing river. He reached in and grabbed her hand. He felt so strong. He pulled her from the water back up to the rock and held her close. Her cold, wet skin succumbed to his warmth. He swallowed her with his arms and his white towel. Within a year, they were living together, but it took four to com commit to marriage. They played relationship tag. Byron was ready, she wasn't. She was ready, he wasn't. In February, during a small window when Whit Lydia was feeling sentimental, they snuggled on a comforter on the floor in front of the TV in the afterglow of lovemaking. Tarzan rescued Jane from the jaws of her ferocious tiger as Byron looked deep into her eyes. I think we should do it. He said in a soft yet determined tone. I think we just did, she replied. I mean, get married. She took, a, she took a deep inhale, uncertain what word would escape with her breath. Okay, she said. On her way to meet Byron at the courthouse, she half expected to get a me message from her father. Maybe she would slide into a snowbank. Maybe her wheels would spin hopelessly on a patch of ice at the intersection. She might have driven a little recklessly, giving fate every chance she could. She arrived on time. It took them a while to get their footing as a married couple. Byron didn't understand that she wasn't tall enough to put trash under the tarp in the back of the truck. And once he did, he quit giving her the stink eye each time he left for the recycling center. And it took her just as long to realize that Byron wasn't interested in her poetry. She could dodge hurt feelings by not asking him to be her audience. But from the very get-go, for the really big things, they had each other's back. More than once, Byron slipped into depression because of his work. Like the time his boss got into total quali quality management and had the staff doing touchy-feely icebreakers at meetings. Byron thought he'd die if he had to tell his favorite pizza topping one more time. Lydia took on new responsibilities in her job so he could quit his and start his own home repair business. As for Lydia, she often went off the deep end with one health craze after another, fish oil, low fat one week, and vinegar and low carb the next. Byron never criticized or argued and never once called attention to the pounds creeping on her once slender frame. 45 years later, after kids, careers, camping, fights, and makeups, all complicated by Lydia's anxiety and softened by his patience, they argue over who gets the remote. Lydia wants CNN. Byron wants ancient aliens. So many people are dying. She feels, compel she feels compelled to watch the news. John Prime is dead. Byron wins the remote because he doesn't feel good. He kicks off his shoes and sinks into the couch. They had been to the grocery store that week. Had they sanitized all, the can all of the canned goods? What are the odds, she mutters inside her head. What's left of his long white hair is pulled into a ponytail. He says he has a chill and that his body feels a tad achy. He coughs. It's probably allergies, he says. He holds up the remote. It shakes in his trembling, aging hand. To be nice, he puts on CNN. People don't actually die in quicksand. Lydia had seen a story on the news where a man from Utah got stuck, but only to his knees. Our lungs make us buoyant. She wished someone would have told her that a long time ago. So much of life wasted wallowing in worry. Now, they are near 80 and quicksand of another kind lurks.
It looks like a slip in the living room on the loose end of the area rug or loss of balance going down the steps or the tumor blocking his colon, the cholesterol filling her veins, keeping the blood from feeding her heart. And COVID seems like a, seems a likely way to suffocate. They'll go down together. She won't let a hospital and a respirator separate them so not, neither could grab hold of the other. She leaves her recliner, falls into the couch next to him. She lays her ear on his chest and listens to the air rasp in his lungs. She gently touches his forehead, checking for fever. She takes the remote and changes the channels. Ancient aliens it is. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. And Lily, if you want to send us off. Sure, yeah. Thank you all so much again for reading for us today. Um, thank you to everyone out there watching for joining us. Um, if you want to tune in to our next reading, it will be on April 18th, and it will feature writers from Eric Steiniger's poetry workshop this semester, which is Black Poets from the 20th and 21st Century. Um, again, a huge thank you to Malapops for hosting us. Don't forget to keep an eye on our website to check for the summer classes, and that is greatsmokies.unca.edu. Happy spring again, and we hope to see you in April. Hey, everybody.